the uh, next talk is on the chemistry of CO adsorption, desorption, and dissociation of supported methylene catalyst C. Lewis, G. Yoko Mizo, N. H. Bell, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Alex Bell is here. Thanks, uh, Jim. Well, this talk is going to continue the theme of the talk that we just heard, although we're going to change the metal from rhodium to ruthenium. I should also say at the outset that, that this is not a new theme, the chemistry of CO chemisorption on ruthenium. But I hope to show you in the next few minutes here that even though the theme isn't new, that one can shed some new light on the subject. By way of background, let me mention that a number of studies have been done on the chemisorption of uh, CO on ruthenium supported on silica. What one finds is typically three bands, with the band positions being at 2140, 2080, and 2040, give or take maybe five or six wave numbers, depending on who's reporting the numbers. The band of 2040 has routinely been assigned to a linear carbonyl, as I'm showing here, and the other two bands are, have been ascribed in the literature, almost without exception, to a ruthenium dicarbonyl. Where there has been controversy, it's been about the state of oxidation of the ruthenium, with some authors suggesting that the ruthenium holding the dicarbonyl is in an oxidized state. And this is based on analogy with what is seen for ruthenium chlorocarbonyls as uh, stable compounds. The objectives of our work were to establish whether or not, for the multicarbonyl, the value of N here is 2, or is it possibly 3, or is it something else? We wanted to quantify the distribution of the different types of adsorbed CO to determine their relative strength of absorption on different sites, and then to determine the extent to which each form of adsorbed CO contributes to CO dissociation. And finally, to ask, is that dissociation process reversible at the temperature at which it occurs, or does one have to go to much higher temperatures before one gets the recombination of the carbon and oxygen? The approach was to use a 3.5% ruthenium on silica sample. The dispersion for the sample is 33%. This is quite typical of what one achieves for silica as a support. Difficult to achieve very high dispersions there. The principal tools that we have used are infrared spectroscopy, which we've applied in combination with temperature program desorption spectroscopy. A little bit later, I'll show you combined TPD-IR spectrum. And then to help unravel the nature of the uh, sites, we've used isotopically labeled CO. <clears throat> now let's look first at the infrared spectrum, remind ourselves where the peaks are. Here is a typical spectrum <clears throat> showing the three peaks here at 2144, 2082 wave numbers, and 2047 wave numbers. The assignment of this central peak is without dispute. We'll come back and discuss the behavior of this, these, this pair of peaks in a, in a moment here. If we change the order in which or we uh, uh, introduce the CO to the catalyst in the form of pulses, what we find is that the band at 20 47 uh, wave numbers, and the large feature here is populated first, and it's only after we start to saturate that feature that we get the pair of bands at the higher frequencies. The other interesting thing is that if we make a, at room temperature a sudden switch from CO12 to CO13, then we can completely exchange this feature and shift this peak 50 wave numbers downscale. However, these peaks cannot be exchanged at all. They're stable. The other thing we find is that during the sequential absorption of CO, the frequency of this band changes. It starts out low and migrates to the final position shown here, whereas these two features populate at a fixed frequency. 
Now, to try and unravel the nature of these high-frequency bands, we've done some mixed adsorption studies involving mixtures of CO12 and CO13. I'm showing you the results here for 75, 25, 50, 50, and 20, 75 mixtures of the C12 and C13 isotopes. The linear feature does exactly what you expect. It migrates from a high frequency position progressively to a low frequency position as we put in more and more of the heavy isotope. The behavior in the high frequency region of the spectrum is much more complex and is not well seen in this spectrum, but can be better understood if we blow up that portion of the spectrum. That's what I'm showing you here. And there are really four bands that I want to draw your attention to, the ones that have been marked. 2144 is the highest frequency, uh, high frequency band, the higher of two high frequency bands, attributable to C12CO. 2095 is its equivalent in a completely uh, C13 CO uh, gas phase. The two bands that appear that are new are the ones at 2036, 2136 and 2124. And these can be ascribed to situations in which we have a multi-carbonyl but with a mixture of CO12 and CO13. Now, I draw your attention to the fact that the relative intensities of two, these two bands switch as we change the mixture from a CO12 rich mixture, which would be uh, the case where 2136 is more intense, to the case where we have a CO13 rich mixture, in which case 2124 is more intense. <coughs> now one must ask how to assign these high frequency bands. Well, one already becomes suspicious about the assignment to a dicarbonyl, because if we had a dicarbonyl and these two intermediate bands were due to the mixed C12, C13 uh, dicarbonyl, one would not expect the relative intensities of these bands to shift as we shift the composition of the mixture. Another reason for being suspicious about the assignment to a dicarbonyl species is shown here. One can take what is known about dicarbonyls in the literature on uh, uh, carbonyl complexes where calculations have been made of the position of the two uh, bands associated with the dicarbonyl for a known angle and try to calculate what one should observe for the uh, location of the bands in a mixed C12, C13 dicarbonyl. Here are the observed bands, 2136 and 2124. We can fit the higher of the two frequency bands here at 2136 if we choose a bond angle of 90.6 degrees. And this is within the range of what is observed in carbonyl complexes. But we can't fit the other. We undercalculate by a great deal. We get 2036. If we try to fit the other band, we can't even come close with known bond angles we can only get into within 2063 of 2064, but then we miss at the other end. And it turns out that there is no one bond angle that would allow you to fit both bands. But let's look at an alternative, namely that the dicarbonyl is not a dicarbonyl, but really a tricarbonyl. This would give us C3 symmetry. C3 symmetry, the symmetry rules tell us that we should only see, uh, we should see three bands then instead of uh, two. We should see two, I'm sorry, we should see two bands if we have the tricarbonyl all with one isotopic label on it. But if we have mixed isotopic labels, we should now see uh, three bands because we changed the symmetry in that case. And what I show you here are the observed fre frequencies again assuming that we had uh, uh, symmetry types of A prime, A prime, and A double prime. And here are the calculated frequencies for a tricarbonyl, in the first case, containing two C12 labeled COs and one C13, and then a converse on the second line. Now I should note that these calculations are done using a bond angle of 88 and a half degrees, which is taken from the literature for carbonyl complexes. 
And the force constants that are needed in these uh, calculations have been determined by fitting the observed frequencies for pure C12 and C13 uh, bands. Then without any further adjustment, we make the, the calculations for the mixed, uh, isotopically mixed tricarbonyls. What you find is the positions of these two bands are now matched perfectly. We do predict that there are an additional two sets of bands, and unfortunately these cannot be observed in the experiments that I've shown you because the linear carbonyl masks this portion of the spectrum. Nevertheless, consistent with the uh, presumption of a tricarbonyl is the way in which the intensity of these two bands shifts as we shift the proportion of C13 to C12 in the mixture. Well, where are these tricarbonyls? Uh, it's unlikely that they're on the particle itself. The reason for that is that the position of the bands doesn't shift as we change the concentration of CO on the surface. What we believe is happening is what might be called cor corrosive chemisorption of CO. We presume that we have largish particles of ruthenium which chemisorb CO and then spall off clusters which have N ruthenium atoms each of which has three CO molecules with it. <coughs> One should correct the stoichiometry here to put in uh, another N after the three. If we are to satisfy the 18 electron rule, which is obeyed more often than not for transition metal complexes, then you can conclude that N ought to be of order five in order for us to have a tricarbonyl. This kind of reaction seems very plausible. Tricarbonyls are known in uh, homogeneous uh, uh, transition metal chemistry. It's also known that when such complexes are put on silica and reduced at the temperatures used for this experiment, that they're not stable and they <coughs> center to form particles. Well, let's summarize what we've learned from infrared spectroscopy, namely that the two high frequency bands are best associated with a tricarbonyl. These are probably present in the form of isolated atoms or possibly small clusters created by this corrosive absorption. The band of 2047, in agreement with previous literature, is assigned to a linear CO. From the isotopic displacement experiments, we can tell that 7% of the ruthenium sites contain the tricarbonyl, and this accounts for 18% of the total CO chemisorbed, a substantial fraction. 93% of the sites, exposed ruthenium sites, then contain the remaining CO in the form of a linear structure. Well, once we've made this quantification, we can then get extinction coefficients, which I've shown you here. And these lie well within the range of extinction coefficients that have been reported for other situations. And the relationship of the CO uh, linear form and tricarbonyl are also in good agreement with what is known for rhodium. I'm going to pass quickly through the temperature program desorption uh, results. Here's a typical TPD spectrum for uh, CO coming off ruthenium. A number of features here, which we'll want to deconvolute. Here's the corresponding infrared spec series of spectra. And I draw your attention to the fact that by the time we've reached about 675 degrees Kelvin, all of the CO has disappeared from the surface. Also draw your attention to the fact that near the onset of desorption here, after we've removed a little bit of the linear form of CO, the tricarbonyl features have almost completely disappeared. If we put on 65% of a monolayer of CO, we get a different TPD spectrum. The low temperature features have disappeared. We only see the high temperature feature. And the infrared spectrum tells us that we only have linear CO present. Therefore, we can associate this part of the spectrum with linear CO, and we see that the CO2, which comes from the Goulard reaction, also, therefore, has to derive from the linear CO. Well, finally, one can take apart the initial PPD spectrum in the following fashion. We attribute this portion of the spectrum to the decomposition of the ruthenium tricarbonyl. It's less stable, and the balance here I'm outlining to the linear carbonyl. The linear carbonyl will undergo disproportionation to produce surface carbon and CO2. 
We can titrate the surface carbon off with hydrogen to produce methane, and the amount of methane we titrate off is in exact agreement with the amount of CO2 produced. Notice also that there are these bumps at high temperatures which are above the temperature where infrared spectroscopy <coughs> says there is any linear CO present on the surface. These features, CO and CO2, arise from the recombination of carbon plus oxygen to form CO, and in this case it should be carbon plus two oxygens to form CO2. Notice that the recombination, the temperature at which recombination occurs, is significantly higher than the temperature at which dissociation occurs, the first step in the disproportionation, therefore telling us that at the temperature of disproportionation, the process is ir ir irreversible. Well, finally, here are the conclusions. The high coverages, the activation energy for CO desorption from the linear carbonyl is lower than from the tricarbonyl. At low coverages, the activation energy for CO desorption from the tricarbonyl is lower than for the, the, the uh, monocarbonyl. The uh, uh, tricarbonyl releases CO at temperatures between 300 and 475 K, but without the formation of CO2. CO desorption from the Particles, metallic particles, begins at 300, reaches a maximum at, five, uh, at 520, and around 500 K, we start to see the Boudoirid reaction occurring. No molecularly absorbed CO is present above 675, and the CO and CO2 we see at higher temperatures than this is all derived from the recombination of carbon and oxygen, which was produced by the dissociation of absorbed CO at lower temperatures. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll use my prerogative to ask the, uh, the first question, or maybe the first statement. That is, this is uh, very interesting. Also, your idea of the uh, tricarbonyl creeping off, maybe onto the support or something, because one thing that you see in um, an atmosphere of CO, especially in flowing, you can actually detect. Uh, resinium pentacarbonyl coming out of your system. And so this may suggest a mechanism by which it's forming. It doesn't form maybe on the planar surfaces or even necessarily the edges and corners, but perhaps it makes the tricarbonyl. This then is moves away from the metal where it can then take on more uh, carbonyl ligands and eventually desorb into the gas phase and migrate out of the right. Now, we, we can't say much about the mechanism, but I should note that a similar pro process is well documented for rhodium by uh, rural prints. That's what I was interested in asking. If you think with ruthenium you could take that corrosive chemisorption further, the way they have seen with um, rhodium, where everything eventually breaks up, and they don't, they don't have any uh, linear C or any um, you know, contiguous uh, um, right. uh, rhodium particles. And if you did get to that point, it seems like you might be able to look for the... Um, the uh, wave numbers that you weren't able to observe because of the linear. Yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, we've been able to observe those by doing another trick, which is to uh, either put in pulses of oxygen, in which case we can selectively react out. So you're out. asking the linear? Yeah, we can re selectively react could, it out. Well, let me just finish the, the, the response. When we selectively react out the linear uh, carbonyl by putting in pulses of oxygen, then we can pick up the second of the three bands. We can't get the, the last one because it's too low in frequency. But then when you compare with the calculations, they're again within two wave numbers without any adjustment of parameters. So we're quite confident about this assignment to a tricarbonyl. I was going to ask if you, if you could do the same thing with um, the Boudouard reaction. You could mask the, um, the linear CO by putting carbon on it because it's obviously, it seems like that's where the carbon's going. When, it, when the CO um, dissociates on the surface, the, the surface carbon, um, that's the linear, uh, your TPD shows the linear CO. It's the linear CO. The linear sites is where the carbon right, goes. Right, on the metallic particles. And the carbonyls just decompose and uh, presumably release uh, ruthenium atoms and the CO goes out the gas phase. Do you think that the ruthenium is zero valent in the tricarbonyl? Uh, we think it is because in, we've carefully <coughs> looked at the TPD spectrum upon reduction and we find no trace of water or hydrogen giving any indication that uh, we have a uh, oxidation. We've also looked at the TPD spectrum, as I've shown you here, uh, after CO chem absorption. We don't see any CO2 coming off or any evidence of a reduction process. 
So we think that what is happening is uh, just neutral, we're forming neutral carbonyls. Now there's, a, there's a, another possibility that can't be completely excluded, and that is that we are reacting to the small ruthenium atoms or clusters with OH groups coming out of the support. And this kind of thing has been observed on alumina. It's less likely, though, to occur on silica. Yes? Uh, when you do the oxygen titration, doesn't the intensity of the band at 2018 go up considerably? Yeah, uh, it does in a relative sense, but not in an absolute sense. But there are instances where that band is much more pronounced than the one at 2130. In a relative sense. You have to be careful to look at absorbance scales and not the arbitrary units. We've done those experiments both with pulsing in oxygen and just pre-oxidizing the cattle. In the pre-oxidation case, you get a slight increase of those bands, but the dominant thing that you see is that you get a massive decrease in the linear uh, uh, form. Yeah. There is no bridge CO. It's CO can now absorb in bridge form in these Catalyst. It's very hard to get it into the bridged uh, form, and we didn't see any evidence for it here. Because of catalyst and how they disperse? Well, it's, it's just the nature of ruthenium. You don't get uh, ever get much in the bridged form. I wonder if, the, you know, relating this to, say, the, the rhodium work, that where with rhodium you can essentially disintegrate the particle or whatever, maybe in the ruthenium, the thermodynamics being different, etc., there are certain low coordination sites so that you can you can make this tricarbonyl and then the process essentially stops. Uh, I suppose with different dispersion one might uh, the rhodium the rhodium tends to be much more highly dispersed to start with when they disintegrate it totally than much higher than what you Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Of course, if you put ruthenium on alumina, you can get uh, the thing completely dispersed, in which case you're dominated by these high frequency bands. Thank you.